My name is Kirsten Dumas. This is Tuesday, October 27, 2015. I'm at the Utah Valley University George Sutherland Archives in Orem, Utah, interviewing Genevieve Atwood for the purposes of the Utah Women's Walk. Today we're going to be talking about Genevieve's life and her contributions to life in the state of Utah. Thank you for coming. I Thank you for interviewing me. It's a job. It's a pleasure. Okay, so we'll start with where were you born and where did you attend school? Much to my dismay, I was born in California. Uh, my dad had been stationed there during World War II. So although I'm fifth generation on my mother's side, I was born in California and am therefore not a native Utah, which I find just terrible. Anyway, <laughs> but we moved back when I was little and I stayed here. And I was lucky to be almost overeducated. So I started out in the quote unquote normal school on the University of Utah, where they were teaching teachers, Stewart School. And so I think I've probably been on the University of Utah campus physically longer than almost anybody there is my guess. Then I went to Roland Hall, which is a private school in Salt Lake. And then I had a choice of going back east if I wanted to, to prep school. And I said, yes, I want to go. So off I went. And then, so from about age 14 to 28, I was back east, getting all sorts of education. My high school, my college, was Bryn Mawr College. I went for a year to France. And um, you'd understand this. Worked sort of in Ireland for a summer. Saw part of Germany on a strawberry picking farm. Then went to grad school. I was b back in Connecticut. And I took my first course in geology and just fell in love with it. I hadn't taken geology because it was the science that people took that didn't like science. And I loved science. So I had all the others and I turned up my nose at earth science, which is very foolish because earth science is just such a pathway to all the sciences. So I got my master's. It took me a little bit of extra time to get it in geology because I hadn't had geology. And then I got my first job in Washington, D.C. So I'd been away from home. I kept going home for vacations and experience. But I had my first job in Washington, D.C., which is with the National Academy of Sciences. And they're a group that was established by Abraham Lincoln to provide advice to government on scientific matters. And it really changed my life. I was with people who were both scientists and policymakers that cared about the country. They were working on issues that mattered. I was on three studies. I was on one study, which was the effects of our national policies on international environmental problems. So when we up our standards for pollution, do we just export the pollution to some underdeveloped country? And then the second one is the reclamation potential of Western coal lands when they are mi surface mined. And that's been my course of academic thought ever since. How do you, how do you work with the land so that natural forces stabilize it? And then the third one was a relatively small study on underground disposal of coal mine waste. I forget when your next questions are. Shall I just keep raving on? You can. Okay, so we'll see. That was education. That was education. Okay. We'll go on to the next question. Um, will you tell us about your early family life? Did you have any siblings? I have siblings. That's right. Um, I'm number two. So uh, my mother had two sets of twins and me in five years. So that's five kids in five years. My older brother died at birth. And so I think I've always been the substitute twin of my older brother. And then I have two younger brothers. So I was a tomboy, grew up in Salt Lake City on the avenues in the house my grandfather built near the University of Utah. And um, I don't know, I mean, I, I had a outdoorsy, marvelous, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a cold. Um, I had a 1940s, 50s upbringing. It was a neighborhood where we could play outside. We were just told to go outside and play. I had all these brothers. And so it, it was a village of sorts. It was near the University of Utah. 
So diversity. And you now we had dogs and a rabbit and you know. I had a just a the kind of one that you see on TV. Now there were challenges. My mom and dad they just fought like cats, but I mean I mean they just yell at each other. I mean my mother was wild, a uh, westerner. She was the Utah. She loved the out of doors. My dad was from back east, Connecticut, and he was sophisticated, urbane, sort of Mr. Chips. Uh, my mother did have an alcohol problem, and she didn't like getting up in the morning, so it was my dad that really, really raised us a lot. He worked out of the house, um, so he was around. So that was probably unusual. I was very close to my dad, and he really, in some respects, he was a Mr. Mom. And my mother was an artist, and she had, in the 1930s and 40s, when women were taking our place in the world, sometimes it's a tool that will allow a whole opening for whomever, and the camera was one of those. And my mother had, was a photographer, and she worked for the Deseret News, and so you get me to think back. She was a, a liberated woman, and um, and my dad. I remember her saying to my dad when they were grumpy, "You can't do anything about her," meaning me. She's going to turn out just like me, and I have. I've got a lot of my mother in me. That's good. Um. What are some of your fondest memories from your childhood? Oh, playing outside for sure. And um, you know, we were, a, I mean, uh, they were just a pack of kids. I mean, I, think, I can't remember what they called this, a six pack or something like that. Though the Kellers were next door and the Sandaks were next door, the Pie Caps, because you see I was on Fraternity Row. And I mean, I hear all these objections to fraternities and sororities now. We gave them so much grief as little kids. We'd dash into the pie caps, and you know, I didn't even know what a jock strap was, but that was the greatest challenge was to try to steal one of those. I mean, I, it was just, we were pests. We were little. I kind of looked like Prince Valiant haircut. We dashed in, we dashed out. There was a, there was a lot of outside stuff. Merrill Engineering had been built, but that whole area where the University of Utah Hospital now was just open fields. My dad had been stationed at Fort Douglas. We could walk the whole way. We walked a lot. So outside was, was really neat. Oh, and I played tennis. In fact, it was quite good. Awesome. Um, who inspired you or who did you admire growing up and why? I should have read these questions beforehand. I mean, I looked at the list and thought, 22 questions. I'm just going to show up and talk. Who, who did I admire? Teachers, of course, make a big difference. Miss Rice was my science teacher. Miss Gilmore taught English. Um, I liked to read. I think my eyes made a huge difference to me. I, had, I didn't have good eyes. And now that I've had cataract surgery, it's corrected my astigmatism. And so I didn't really see edges until I was, you know, in my 60s. And so although I, I read a lot, I remember Queen Victoria and, you know, I, so there were those kinds of people. Um, so as a child, I don't think I was hooked on sports, um, heroes. Uh, we didn't watch TV. I spent some time in Never Never Land, just fantasy, but I wasn't into to science fiction. I think it was people in books. I mean, I, I was influenced by people in the Bible. We went to, to church. My, we didn't have any particular denomination. My dad had been Episcopalian. We stayed Episcopalian. My mother was Catholic. I was a Presbyterian, Cubs, you know, uh, Brownie Scout. Yeah, LDS 
Girl Scout, or at least we met at the ward. So um, I don't think, you know, I don't, I don't remember particular heroes as a child. That's all right. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, number five. Is there one experience from your early beginnings that you think prepared you for your work in geology, science, and math? Probably, and I probably didn't recognize it. We had a 1954 DeSoto station wagon, and my dad would just throw us in and we'd go places. So we went to Dinosaur National Monument before it was, had buildings and stuff. And, and this was a time when there were, they were looking for uranium, and my dad and my mom would pick up the Geiger counter, <laughs> go to southern Utah, you know. This was a car that if you had, were going downwind and downhill, you could get it to 65 miles an hour. I mean, this was way cool. It was fire engine red, beige on top. It was just, it was just great car. Put in the dog, fall asleep in the back. No seatbelts. I think that made a huge difference to me. I was never strapped in. And it's got to make a difference to kids. I, anyway, I'm, I hear safety and the rest, but I, loved. Anyway, so I, I think one of my early memories of which I have a picture was going to the Grand Canyon and thinking, this is cool, I hope there are lots of them. Not realizing how special it was to get to go to these different places. And I think that made a difference. My dad wasn't a camper, uh, but he liked to have us see things and be outside and yeah, I think I think being outside, maybe, probably Dinosaur National Monument. Awesome. Um, number six, would you tell me about your educational pursuits and where you studied? Were you always a good student? Oh, I probably was a better student than I realized. But my older brother was so smart. I mean, he could read when he was two. I'm kidding. But, I mean, maybe he was five. and it, and I remember sitting with my dad, he made this list called Happy A's. Be willing <laughs> to just do it again. So, I mean, I, I think being around an older brother who was so bright, I, I didn't feel. But um, I had bad writing, which I now attribute to my bad eyes. I, didn't, I, I did have trouble reading, and I attribute that to not seeing edges as well. Reading print wasn't ever a joy for me. Um, but I always loved science. I loved how things worked. I liked animals. I liked, um, I would, uh, although I took some things apart, didn't get them back together again very well, and wasn't really into puzzles. I was interested in what made things happen. I loved water. When it would rain, we were in an area that if you didn't go, if you didn't just make sure that the water was going the right places, you could flood the house. So my dad and I would go out and we would do the irrigation, okay? For a while we had a farm up in Heber and, and I loved going out and irrigating. I loved the way water would flow. So I, I think that, I think I always loved science. I think I was always pretty good in school. I must have been. But, oh, this will be helpful. I call myself a convoy speed person, meaning when I'm in a slow convoy, it's fun to go slow. But when I'm in a fast convoy, I just pick it up. And that was the advantage of my education because I was in remarkable schools. I was never the top in my class. I was usually number two or three. I love being number two or three. I love being around people. I'd, I've never had to be the smartest or the whatever. I like to win. So when there are only two, I'd rather win an election than lose. But I love being a number two person, particularly in school. So yeah, I was probably number two or number three or number four in every class I was in and until I went away to school. When I was 14, I went to Milton Academy outside of Boston and promptly was at the bottom of the class. 
and oh my god, my dad had me memorize one of these letters that said, you know, Lola, which was my nickname because no one could say Genevieve, or spell it. And apparently I'd look like, you know, Lotus Blossom or something like that. Anyway, Lola was my name. And they said, Lola is either unwilling or unable to conform to boarding school life. And my dad, bless him, wrote back, said, she's a very fine person and it's your problem. You accepted her. If you made a misstep in judgment, it's your fault. And she is just a sweet person. And, and then when I got home for vacation, I had to shape up. It was hard to shift. It was back east. I remember they didn't have sprinklers on their lawn. I just thought it was weird. And I was from Utah, and the only person from the West, really. They tried to be open-minded and have one person per class from the West. Now, of course, it's changed. There's lots of diversity. I distracted. That's right. So yeah, I'd, uh, at Milton, I dropped to the bottom. But by the end, I was convoy speed. I picked up That's good. and was able to be national merit. I wasn't a finalist. I, I wasn't a scholar as a finalist. But it was, a, it was an awfully bright class. So in my era, I guess five folks went to Radcliffe. It hadn't become Harvard yet, but it was parallel. Um, it, it was a fast convoy, and it really set my standards. Its motto was, dare to be true. That's, I bought into that. And uh, they did not do well with me on science because it was still an era where women were meant to be, you know, wives. And well-educated wives, supportive wives, wives of powerful people. But, and they wouldn't have said that as you were going, but that was really what was, it was intended to do. So when I arrived at Milton, I was ahead in math and behind in things like Latin and French. So they pulled me out of math, and they would never do that today. Never, ever do that today. And, uh, but I got to take science. I was head of the science club. I took astronomy and physics and biology. I just woofed down the science. Awesome. Um, will you share with me any information about courtship and married life and extended family experiences? Sure. I went to this college in the 1960s, because remember, I'm a product of the 60s, and this is this wild change of women controlling our bodies and and suddenly things were open to us and there was civil rights and I was on a campus where you know the people really put out on marches and stuff like that I did not I felt I was there for education so I wasn't one of the people that was active in that regard but um, this college was, I was an all-women's college. So many were. So my brothers went to Harvard and to Yale, and I couldn't. And it still bothers me that my older brother went to Yale and sang his way through, and I wasn't even allowed to go. And, I mean, I just felt that was a, a waste. I mean, he should have put out and done it. Well, I'm not sure I would have gotten in, but I think I probably would have. I was. I was actually quite good in tennis, so I'm not good in sports. So um, at, at Bryn Mawr, they had this phrase, our failures only marry. Now that's quoted as only our failures marry, which it isn't. But it was a place that really had a strident pride that one would accomplish something. And that just marrying is not enough. And so uh, I've always, I, one of the reasons I went into geology is I just love men. <laughs> I like to be around men. And I mean, sometimes I'm in these classes and I was talking to Helen Graber, who used to be at the University of Utah. She says, you know, there used to be just one man in some of my classes. And one time I asked why I did it. And he said, so I can be around women. That isn't why I went into geology. But certainly, being around men, you know, all my brothers and stuff. So I've had men friends all my life, and uh, still do. And uh, I got older, 
and I didn't realize, and, and by then I was back home and had done half these things that you're going to have me talk about later, but I had had opportunities to marry kind of the people I should have, so back east, attorney, things like that. And um, this one in particular, he really was smitten, and I was too. And um, I had an opportunity to go to Honduras and do field work. And he said, I want to get married. I said, uh, I got to go to Honduras. This is in my soul. Couldn't believe he'd marry someone else. Couldn't believe it. And sure enough, while I was in Honduras, got the letter that said, but I did meet her, and they divorced. And, he's, and she, I said, you know, how could he say those things to me and then marry you? And she said, um, he always loved you. Anyway, so there were opportunities, but, but basically I wasn't, you know, I was kind of, didn't plan it. And my advice to young women, particularly here in Utah where we think about eternity, I never thought of marriage as eternity. Um, I think there are opportunities that come and go. So when my biological clock started going, and it doesn't go tick, tick, tick. It goes bong, bong, wango, wango. Um, I'd really sort of had a criteria of what kind of person I wanted to marry. Let's see if I can remember them. I had to be physically attracted to them. Uh, the whole physical side of things mattered to me. They had to be real smart, preferably smarter than me. And that was never a problem because I am enormously attracted, just like a moth, to, to smarts. And then there was, uh, I wanted someone that wanted to be married to a politician. That eliminated an awful lot of folks. Someone who wanted to, who didn't want to be elected, wanted me to be elected. And um, someone who I hadn't known well um, answered all those criteria. He was very smart. He was very good looking. The physical was fabulous while it lasted. And um, it was a short marriage. It turned out to be kind of abusive. And it was a two-way street. I learned, I remember meeting so up with someone who I'd been back east with. He said, what are you learning through this? And I said, I've learned to lie and I've learned to fight. And that was all new to me. And that was a short marriage. And I think it was really tough on him as well. I think, I think divorce is brutal. Uh, you can talk to me in a few years, but I think, I think divorce is harder than death. Yeah. It's just so tough. Anyway, um, I did marry my best friend, Don maybe. As you know, he died two weeks ago. I'm very sorry. I know. And I say to myself, I'm fine. But sometimes it doesn't quite feel good. Yeah. So I'll try not to. He was very smart. He loved me. He was much older than me. He was not well when I married him. Um, and he said all the right things. And among them were that he really wouldn't get old because I was scared of actually taking care of my dad. He said he believed, you know, A, had, he was not very well. B, his whole family had prostate cancer. He was diagnosed with it a long time ago. His brother had died of prostate cancer after fighting it, and Don was not someone who enjoyed being scared. So he said, I'm just not going to fight it. Of course, he lived forever. We used to go in and see these doctors, and they'd have the residents come in, and the residents, you know, if a man has a PSA of two, they start chopping things off at four. Don was 700. These residents would come in and say, oh, Mr. Maybe, so sorry. And he'd say, about what? And he'd say, how's your quality of life? And he'd say, it's great. Married to someone I love, doing things I can. So he didn't, he didn't, he accepted his cancer. He was, he was a very strong, good person. 
but he didn't know that he was going to sort of lose it mentally. And so although he'd said he had the pills and the guns and he would never, you know, live to be forever, he did. And it was tough as he lost his mind. It was really hard. And he didn't lose it for a long, 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 long time. He, I, he probably lost it when he was, he started to lose it when he was maybe 81 <laughs> or so and he died at 88. But um, that was hard because this was somebody who changed so much. And I think I am probably different people than I was. You know, I get to choose to some extent what aspects of me will be the most important over the next 10 years. But he was a different person and I really lost my Don probably five years ago when conversations ceased to make sense, you know. Yeah. And that will face our whole country. Yeah. In other words, when I went to his, I'll distract, because I like talking to you. I like talking, but I like talking to you. Because of American history, I went to a talk by John Huntsman Jr., whom I admire, and it was about China. But he started out by saying there are three issues facing our country. He said, number one, the aging of Americans and the advancement of health care. Number two, the political rise of Islam. This was before it was in our face. Number three, China. And then he talked about China. But this whole issue of aging, health care costs, how long we live, our quality of life, good luck, Kirsten, because it's going to be on your generation. It will be. It's really tough. Um, will you tell us about your experience being a Utah State Representative? I loved being a representative. So Mr. Hinckley founded the Hinckley Institute of Politics and he was a friend of my dad. They lived in the same apartment house. Mr. Hinckley had a place up in Eden, Utah. Uh, but when he was in Salt Lake, he stayed there. And he lost his wife and my dad said to me when I was back east, would you just go to dinner with this person? I was clueless who Mr. Hinckley was. And I thought, well, it's dinner. You know, <laughs> I'm young, I'm in Washington, I'm working. And Mr. Hinckley said, submit your life to the fun test. Not fun test. I don't do fun. I was a pretty serious little kid. He said, what do you really want to do? Do you want to try to work for a mining company? And remember, they weren't hiring women. Still, only the really best geologist women get hired by mining companies. Or do you want to go into academia? And I thought, well, that's kind of nice. Or do you want to work in, you know, nonprofit? Or do you want to run for the legislature? And I thought, <laughs> and I thought, I didn't know he probably said this to several people. Anyway, so I did want to come home. And um, as we talk about men, there were men in my life in Washington as well, and it was a good time to head home. So um, I, I, he said, go to the Hinckley Institute of Politics and just find out. And J.D. Williams said, what do you really want to do when you grow up? It's kind of, he didn't say it that way. I said, I like being around powerful people. Um, and so, I really ran so that I could be with people who made a difference. And that was the way it was then. And I think I didn't, I, the seat was open. I had chosen to be Republican. I love money, I love strength. But I also had been back in Boston, which was such a church-dominated Democratic Party. And I didn't like those Democrats that were just so into, anyway little realizing that in many respects I was choosing a party that was church-oriented in Utah. I mean, it seems wild that I didn't know that. But I'd been president of my college, you know. Um, so I just treated it like field work. I walked everywhere. I loved campaigning. And Kirsten, I was representative of my district. It was the avenues in Federal Heights. And I was young. I ran against somebody who had been in the legislature and um, he kind of took me for granted that I was going to be not a chance, I was going to win. It just wasn't a chance. I mean, it's 27. I mean, or, or, it just amazes me that I would 
the people would have voted for me. But it was during Watergate, a lot of people had voted for Nixon. They may not say so, but they didn't mind seeing a friendly Republican face. And he, everyone else was attorneys, and I was a geologist, and I won the primary because I won the primary. I won the general, even though it had been a Democratic seat before. No, I love the legislature. No matter who gets in the legislature, they make a difference. They can do good, they can do harm, but things will change. And I had good advice, and I was on committees, and um, I worked hard, and I think the state was better for what I did. So I sponsored, as one of those, what legislation did I sponsor? I sponsored the Utah's Mine Line Reclamation Act. Uh, which was important. I did some stuff on earthquakes, but I also did open and public meetings. So that was a major accomplishment of good government. And the area where I made the most difference that most people don't pay attention to is the money. I love money. Money for me has always been freedom, and it was in my family. So we had resources, but we never squandered them. And if you could show that something was constructive, you could do it. It wasn't, you can't afford that. It was, is this constructive? And, and so being on budget committees, that's where I worked to have Utah be sort of safer, better place. It was good. Awesome. Um, is it correct that Governor Matheson appointed you in 1981 as, a, as the state geologist? Yes. The first female in the United States. Maybe anywhere. So. What were you able to accomplish following this position? So two things there. I, I was targeted by the right wing um, as a moderate. And so, so were other people. We didn't even see this coming. The right hand turn of the Republican Party in Utah based on morality. So I had actually worked to have organizations such as Planned Parenthood be able to provide services to women, a lot of social services. I, was on the, I chaired the Social Services Committee on Appropriations. And I remember once, um, just basically, some of the handouts that were anti-Planned Parenthood were disgusting. They were, I remember in one meeting saying, is this pornography? And of course, afterwards, the anti-Planned Parenthood people were saying, no, 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 it wasn't. But I was targeted for standing for crime, pornography, abortion, ERA, and evolution. And I lost in a Republican primary by only 14 votes. And that's what, supposedly, I was standing for. But of course, you know, I just felt one should uphold the Constitution. and. Yeah, I do. Th I, I wasn't a strong feminist, but my district wanted the Equal Rights Amendment. And yeah, I don't think evolution is a belief. I think that's pretty well established. So, so Matheson knew me because he'd been active in neighborhood councils, and so had I. And so his wife had actually been, I think, it was here in Utah County. She'd been booed. Uh, when she was giving a speech for just being too moderate. And so this was a time in which we just were clueless of the tribal nature that, that parties were going to become and how hadn't really figured out that the way you win an election is to be negative. So Kirsten, when you run for something, there are two ways that everybody votes. There are four ways if there are two candidates. People vote for a candidate or against the candidate, for the candidate or against the other candidate. Eighty percent of people vote against. So of course campaigns are going to be negative. And that's why I see them. I mean, it's sad, and I won't go on with approval voting, but there are ways to change this. So Matheson knew me, and he basically said, we need good women in office. And Matheson's record was fabulous. And he said, what would you like to do? Do you want to be head of uh, the Mindline Reclamation, because that was kind of my field, or what? And it turned out that this job, called the State Geologist job, was open. And the State Geological Survey makes the state richer, safer, better understood geologically. And so 
I got that job because Matheson and his group really said, I want her to have it. And at first the board said, are you kidding? We'll all resign if you cram her down our throats. But it turned out it was a glorious time for geologists and not many people wanted the job. So I got it. And wonderful staff, wonderful mission. Uh, I was good on the money. I'm just good on the money. I, I love money for what you can do with it. So I was able to strengthen the geological survey. We went into a basic mapping program where uh, everyone can use the information. It still exists. We did lots on earthquakes. And that's when I met Don Maybe, because he'd had a distinguished career with the United States Geological Survey. And he wanted the first female geologist to say geologist to be a success. So we worked together for years. And then he was sick, he left. And um, by then I'd gone through my marriage and I was actually thinking about, I wasn't just thinking, I was on track to have kids by artificial insemination and Don said, he was really cute. We were walking along and he could digest this information. He said, you know, there are other ways. <laughs> it's got to be the greatest quote in the whole <laughs> wide world. So um, I loved being part of the geological survey. I decided that I should stay more than five years but less than ten because I watched how other state geologists could become more and more political and then be targets and then hurt their survey. So I think I stayed eight years and I think the state is safer with respect to earthquakes. I was there for the 1980s wet cycle and the staff were wonderful. They said, you should stay in science. Don't just become an administrator, do research. So they'd find me these sort of um, wasn't that they were simple, it was that they were not extended research programs. And so I started studying Great Salt Lake because they said, why don't you figure out how many times the lake has been above this level based on the shorelines. You go to Antelope Island, and I was interested, but then I fell in love with Great Salt Lake and Lake, and lake Bonneville. Um, I've heard about your involvement in the 1983 Thistle Creek landslide. Yeah. Will you tell me more about it? What were the conditions when you arrived? What were your contributions to prevent more destruction from taking place? Sure. And Kirsten, you know, firefighters like fires, secretly. Geologists kind of like natural <laughs> hazards. And it was the perfect natural hazard for people to become aware that these have processes behind them. You understand the process, you can avoid them. So geologists say, you know, engineers solve problems. Geologists avoid them. I mean, it's kind of snooty. But anyway, that, there, when, when I was in the legislature, there really was almost a belief that one could not do something about earthquakes. And, and natural disasters sort of came about. And it was clear that these things had a geologic past. So in the fall of 2000, of 19, 1982, it is a long time ago, <laughs> it just started to rain. It was an El Nino, and maybe we're in another one right now. They're mumbling about it. And everything got wet. And then, in the springtime, uh, things started to, there were just problems around. There were little blocks lands. And then, I guess it was something like February 12th or 17th, around that time, a truck, cars were coming down from Spanish Fork to uh, from Thistle to Spanish Fork, or vice versa. And they hit a bump. And then the bump was a foot tall. And then the bump was bigger. And so this massive landslide that had moved many times in the past and had dammed the Spanish Fork River there uh, was on the move. And 
Matheson was really curious about science. I loved working with Matheson. I loved working with Bangader, but they were very different. Matheson, you know, his staff would sort of haul us out of his office because he would just talk to us, we'd go in there, and and so he just sent us up in a in a helicopter and said, "What's going on?" And we responded, and the Utah survey was terrific. And so with Thistle, the problem was. Could this be catastrophic and flood everyone? So the landslide, if this is the river, and this is the Wasatch Front down here, okay, the landslide was coming down through here, gritching across here, and of course it, not of course, but as it moves, it just becomes higher and higher and higher. So it was building a natural dam across there with water behind it. Now I was very impressed uh, by how science was um, included in the decision making. And I ended up doing, I got my, I'm overeducated. I got my master's, later got my master's in public administration. And I looked at the contrast of how the railroad looked at science versus how the state looked at science and concluded that anything that really involved money, the railroad was actually better on using science. So, Rock can be more competent or less competent, and railroads do not like sharp turns. But the railroad realized that one of the units that would let them make a less steep turn was incompetent. So they were all over the geologic information, and they took the steeper turn. They got the better place for their road. They were on it. But they were kind of Na they, it wasn't that they were nasty, they just, nobody trusted them by the end. So the currency for the railroad was money, but the currency for government was trust. And Matheson and the science, you know, the state, we really had the confidence of people, and, and we did well. But the water kept rising behind this natural dam, the question was, how do we stabilize it? And then the division of water rights and water resources just were so clever. They sort of figured out a way to sneak underneath it and drain it. And, and, um, and then the Department of Transportation. They were not the railroad. And they could have cared less about earth science from our perspective. They went from A to B. They had landslides. They had failures. And they had lots of money. So disasters, Kirsten, can be really good for the economy, which most people don't realize. Now, if it's too big and too bad, that's a real problem. But Thistle basically was awesome for Utah County. Every piece <coughs> of, of earth-moving equipment was out there. So. This was a big deal, and then it just continued. Through the summer, there were lots of little slides, big slides. The Great Salt Lake was rising. We were right on it. We did not realize that the use of water would not keep the lake low, because when it's raining, people don't need it for their farms. Um, and that was, that was, it was, a, it was just the perfect natural hazard for the Utah Geological Survey to respond to. Our people went out, they would, often where there's a community and they have a spring, it, will, it can be in an area where there's a landslide because water and material make things slide. And it isn't necessarily because it lubricates them, it's usually there's a surface underneath that the water gets on and slides onto that. So our teams would go out to these communities, San Pete County, diverse places, and find what had gone on with their water systems and put them back together. It could give people alerts. In communities where there were going to be what's called a debris flow, which is a sudden release of, of just, it's almost like a slurry that comes downhill, we put animal collars on trees. And then we could track. If the trees started to move, we could evacuate people. We never really tested that, but they were there, so we could give people warning. And I think by the end, people had realized 
that there were things that you could do to avoid landslides and that you probably could do for earthquakes that you really ought to do in terms of flooding. I mean, I watched them putting this prison out on the shores of Great Salt Lake and the mosquitoes are gonna be amazing. I mean, the LDS church decided to not do their development of Lakeshore, which I called floodplain. It was a better title for that city. And because there was a minuscule chance, among other things, of a tsunami, when the, if the lake should be high, of just wiping out 25,000 people. And here we are. Anyway, that's, I'll stop on that. But I have strong feelings about respecting Great Salt Lake. It's our neighbor. It's a fabulous advantage for our community. And we're killing it by a thousand cuts. And I hardly know how to not have that happen because we are at economic war with China. And magnesium is an essential part of our community. And Great Salt Lake is, when you drink a can of pop, it's magnesium from Great Salt Lake that's keeping that thing from being tinfoil. End of lecture. What's the next question? <laughs> um, you wrote a bill that would require full disclosure of geologic hazards. Oh, um, I so uh, wish, and we could do that, Kirsten. With GPS, you could have Utah's, I think there are eight big hazards. There's collapsible soils, there's flooding, there's debris flows, there's landslides, there's ground shaking from earthquakes, there's surface rupture. You could have that on every person's property as just disclosure. So if you don't want to know about your problem, you don't have to know. But if you want to know, you could say this is the problem. You could have it go to some database that tells you roughly where it was. Sure, some areas wouldn't be better than others. But this idea that North Salt Lake is saying, we didn't know it was a landslide. I Come on, give me a break. If it slid once, it's going to slide again. But it didn't go through for two reasons, one of which was we weren't as we didn't have the databases that we should have had. And um, developers were starting in my era, my era, educator, attorneys had been a core group of the legislature. Then educators, because they were given time off, et cetera, but then that was stopped. But in my era, it was starting to be the developers and it's become very development oriented. So um, I think if people were starting to say, maybe, maybe this is too much government interference to let people know what their hazards are. I didn't say they had to zone them, just think, I don't know what they are. Flooding, I mean, you know. Payson, you wanna know whether someone's gonna have high groundwater in case they're surfacing sewage, you know, in the future. Next. Um, have you seen any progress since that bill failed on? There is huge progress on information available. And so I think as a country, we realize, particularly climate change, climate change, we're saying to yourself, maybe these things aren't by accident. Maybe there are actually processes that we can understand and avoid. And I think that even though people would debate, quote unquote, whether climate change is happening, I don't know anybody who isn't saying, oh, but the weather seems different. I mean, I think there's an awareness of natural hazards, natural processes, more and more with time. I'm not sure that there's much more respect for it, but um, no, I think there is respect. But from a government perspective, we still let people do really dumb things. And my sense is if people want to do dumb things and it doesn't affect others, we should let them do it. But if it's going to affect others, it, they should have to disclose it. Mm -hmm. um, I read in a brief biography of you that you are concerned that Utah politics is increasingly tribal, attacks are highly personal, and democracy is hurting. How is democracy hurting in Utah and or the United States, and how can Utahns and Americans... You have done well? your homework. I do. That was, you said that as well as I could have said it, and maybe I did say it. Um, And I, I mean, I could rave on about it in such detail. I think 
A, it's become personal. B, the negative really wins. And Kirsten, I'll be interested to watch as we learn more and more about these ultra-social societies, be they ants or termites or humans, how tribalism is fundamental to us. And I was watching this PBS program just a couple of weeks ago, it's on my mind, in which E.O. Wilson was saying, when, that the, there basically is an altruism force within a tribe that that makes an ultra-social society function. So in ants or termites, there's just a whole bunch of soldiers that go out there and they get decimated. And, and there are also ones that, he calls it the altruism, whatever, that, that makes people do something for society that isn't in their personal gain. And that among tribes, that altruism, whatever, makes that tribe thrive. But within the tribe, selfishness wins. You must have studied this just watching you. <laughs> I find that fascinating because I, I watch us, and some of it is that there just seem to be fewer and fewer resources, even though we figure out more and more resources. I do think that there is no reason to have overpopulation. And that uh, the world at large has, has, has just gone, we're, as a species, you just weigh us compared to weighing all the tigers versus weighing all the elephants versus weighing all the ants versus weighing all the trees versus whatever, we're out of whack. And, and so I think that tribalism is an issue and it comes out in politics as we and they. And by tribalism, I mean that you would treat someone in another tribe differently than you would treat your own folks. And one of my tribes is elitist women's. And I love my tribe. I want us to win. You know? And so the tribe can be uh, any number of shared characteristics. But it does seem to me that with our, this vote for one, vote against one, vote for one, vote against the other, then unless we change that, we will continue to have negative politics. And it will continue to to discourage people. I don't think my reputation, in spite of all your lovely questions, will ever be the same after having run for Congress. I think that uh, the negative worked. It wasn't necessary. Wayne Owens had many more resources than I did. Uh, I thought my reasons for running were good. I uh, love money. <laughs> and I thought I'd handle it a lot better than he did. He was good for democracy. He was, but I, I did not realize that it was going to be so negative and so hurtful. And one way to get around it, I'll just do this approval voting. And my, I have this younger brother who's kind of just over the top on this issue, but I think he's right on this one. Approval voting means that let's say there are five candidates and you think three of them are okay. You could vote for those three in order. And that means everyone wants the second vote. So you can, it would scatter our parties. It would mean lots of little parties would exist. But it would mean that there's no reason for you to trash me because you really want my votes to come to you if you don't win. So, uh, and my little brother gives this analogy of where do you go to dinner? got eight people and one person really wants Indian and another person really wants D burgers. Everybody sort of settles in on something that's okay for everyone. And that would be good. And it would reduce tribalism. Um, what advice do you have for Utah women who are interested in getting involved with Utah politics? In spite of everything I said, I'd say go for it. <laughs> and was there a second part to that? I interrupted yes. you. Yes. 
Um, any other general advice for you, Utah women? Oh, I think, you know, Mr. Hinckley's advice of, you know, submit your life to the fun test, and he didn't mean it just frivolous, he meant joy factor. I think to follow that, I think for women it's good to plan. I think I should have planned better about life in some ways. Um, but I think forging ahead, I think having a sense of, of purpose, even if it leads in different directions. Politics is wonderful. Well, tribes have their advantages. I mean, we're tribal for reasons. And those reasons are terrific. So when you have a cause and are working with other people, it's a social moment that's terrific. And you can become jaded and you can become uh, sour, but my sense is you can also feel as if you've made a difference. So I've got this granddaughter who talks about the five languages of love. And one of the languages is acts of service. And I think that really is true. I think for people who have that particular language that makes them feel good, that acts of service being involved in politics is great. Not everybody has it, so the person I married. Um, acts of service didn't mean politics. So, um, so I'd recommend it, no matter what. I think that we're in a time of equality and excitement and control. I love control. We can... Um, I think everything that you know we hear about women, uh, I really cheer for. I love to see, I love to see one of my granddaughters have a grandchild who's now just turned one, and everything was pink, and that's all she really wanted was to have kids. And my sense is, for her, that really is what she wants to do. And uh, I see another one who was just so so wise. She went to the University of Utah to find a guy and she found a good one. And then she decided, well I guess I've had trouble with anatomy but maybe I could become a nurse now that I've settled down. She did. So I think to, to figure out what you want to do and go for it. Um, I think as I get older I end up realizing there are many, many ways to achieve happiness and make a difference. And I probably become less good at giving advice. So I'll work on it some more, Kirsten, because people aren't asking me as much for advice these days. I think the only savior for our country will be women's education. Uh, and I think women's education in science is essential. So maybe that would be my advice, to go outside and look at the world around you and gain a sense of meaning with respect to place. Okay, this really is it. I'd forgotten, this is what I do, Kirsten. It would be for everyone, but particularly true of women because kids and people who have a sense of place do better in school than kids who don't. And with this disengagement from nature, it hurts us, and it hurts us as a species. And that would be, I would say, women in science, to never be scared of science and to embrace earth science as the pathway into all sciences. And it is, and when I talk to teachers who, elementary school teachers are mostly women, they think that science is vocabulary. That's reading. Whereas I would really say that to be happy, you gotta be able the way we did this morning, we saw the moon and it was glorious. So although that may not sound like politics, I think it's sounding like being fundamentally grounded. And I think that if we aren't fundamentally grounded, particularly women, because we pass this on to others, we're in trouble. I do think we're kind of in trouble. 
as a scientist, you, um, I read that you spent about 15 years working for nonprofit yeah. organizations. What nonprofits did you work for, and are there any specific stories you'd like to share about uh, your experience? Way early on, I was associated <laughs> with the National Academy of Sciences, which is non governmental and would be a nonprofit of sorts. And it did set a lot of values the idea that people who are wildly intelligent commit to doing good things for their country. And, you know, uh, one of my loose screws is that I think that intelligent people are nice people. And that ain't necessarily so. But it sure was within not for profits. And I, you know, I think they've changed a lot. I think they've just become extensions and ways of avoiding taxes. And I worry about that. But I do run earth science education. And what we do is we encourage people to go outside, see the world around them, and then become interested in science because science is just so cool. It's so much fun. And it's, we got to understand it or, you know, you're out in left field. I mean, so, yeah, that's what I do. Tell me again this, the question. Um, uh, what nonprofits did you work for? And do you have any specific stories of your experience with a certain nonprofit? Well, certainly there are lots of stories associated with uh, either the National Academy of Sciences or Earth Science Education. <coughs> I think that maybe Utah, here's a story. So Utah wants our teachers to teach half of every school day literacy and half of the rest of the day numeracy. So we're sneaking in science into stories. So this is a story that someone wrote, one of my teachers. Are you my bedrock? Okay. Um, nice piece of speckled white rock here. Goes off to Delicate Arch. Nice picture and says, are you my bedrock? And the Delicate Arch says, let's look at your pattern. No, I'm not your bedrock. So Little Rock goes up to Farmington Canyon in Davis County and says, are you my bedrock? Bedrock says, let's look at your pattern. No, not my bedrock. And then it goes to Little Cottonwood Canyon and says, are you my bedrock? And the granite there looks at it and says, let's look at your pattern. Yeah, I'm your bedrock. I think that when a teacher does that with Utah places and a Utah rock, it is invaluable compared to learning about Iceland or Hawaii or even Yellowstone. That idea that you can go outside and see what you see and then say, let's be evidence driven. Let's look at your bedrock. Let's look at your pattern. Could there be a relationship? Okay. Awesome. Um, you're currently a, a professor at University of Utah. Uh, what made you decide to go into the teaching field? Well, then I'm only adjunct. And I assure you that there is a whole, it used to be that adjunct was an honor. It isn't anymore. And I just take it. I mean, because I'm the Genevieve Atwood and I love to teach. Um, I love to be around smart people. And so the academic environment is right at home. It's where I can fulfill my mission to get particularly young women interested in science at the University of Utah. I teach the ones who are heading into, into teaching. I teach Geography of Utah, which I think when people understand how physical geography makes a difference to us. And once again, it is a sense of place. So it allows me to be with people that I consider I want to be of that tribe. Not perfect, I'm peripheral to the tribe. And I think I can make a difference, yeah. Um, if you're comfortable with sharing, what do you feel has been a, your most significant trial in your life? Oh, interesting. I've been so lucky. I mean, really all my trials I've had support systems. I think watching my husband lose his mind was really hard. And realizing that, that my feelings were really ambivalent. 
I mean, I felt betrayed. This guy said yeah. he'd knock himself off. Now, I'm not saying <laughs> that I was cheering for that, but I am saying that it means that when I get there too, I mean, even when he was, you know, under horrific conditions and had no idea what day it was or, I mean, it was only a short period of time he didn't know who I was, and that was a while ago. But he would say, you know, I'm having such physical problems, but at least my mind's together. I mean, he, it wasn't there. And I think that, I think the difficult part of that wasn't just not having a sense of timing and how to live my life. It was also to realize that such an extraordinary person that I could be there too and to not have a sense of how to handle that. So I think my worst trials are to come. But uh, other trials, I think having friends makes a difference. And, uh, and I also think and I hope this comes out okay, but having the freedom of money, and, and I'm not saying off the charts rich, but I do not have to be dependent on, my lifestyle is such that I'm fine, and I, I really am. And I think that as a country we are so rich, and we should realize how strong we are and go towards strength. So, um, so I've had cancer, uh, breast cancer. I was lucky that it wasn't all that bad and I was amazed at how my body wanted to be healthy. So not a major trial. Um, so I can't answer that one very well. That's perfect. You okay. It sounds like you're a very busy lady. I'd be busy in a box. <laughs> and you know, Kirsten, it's not necessarily good because, you know, I just am always busy. And I mean, even, yeah, just busy. In your spare time, what, what do you like to do? I, I crave exercise. And I love my Fitbit. I feel badly when I don't hit my 10,000 steps. I need exercise. And my brother, who's a doctor, was saying to one of my sisters-in-law, because my, one of my older brothers is overweight, and she was saying he's got to lose weight. And Eddie was saying half hour of exercise a day makes more difference than what people weigh or what they do. It's just, and it actually I think may help my brother not be as constant. Well, he doesn't pay attention to his weight, what he does. But that idea of moving <coughs> and I, I've got a place at my office where I can stand. So when my husband was watching just Perry Mason for, I really know the Perry Masons. There are not many I haven't seen and I sometimes forget who the victim was murdered by. But I would use my, my, my stepper. So that is something, I've got a dog. So I, I score introvert, and I don't get my energy from being around people, but that's where I'm able to make a difference. But I will go to Oregon this coming week and be there for two or three weeks by myself, but I'll be busy, Kirsten. Yes. I, I may be busy by myself, but I'll be knocking out that, you know, geologic history of Utah for teachers. I'll be figuring out, I think, I mean, I don't know what's necessarily going to caught me in a period of transition, but I don't think I'm really going to change character. But I will be busy, but um, it isn't always with people. That's good. Um, what do you feel has been your, the biggest reward from your several careers? Um, oh, it's, I mean, it sounds so cocky. But I was at yoga, and they were doing these mantras. You are here, you are, the, you are breath, and then they were doing one is, you are strong, <laughs> you are healthy, you are competent. You could choose. I mean, there must have been 15, but um, I like that I'm strong, and I like that I'm healthy. And I like that I'm competent. Awesome. Um, 
Are there any words of wisdom or maxims that you've lived your life by? Oh, and I have one on my mirror. And I was trying, you know, as I was just thinking, Genevieve, why can't you remember this? And I wish it was. It was one was happiness comes from something that's challenging, autonomous, worthy, worthwhile, and there's something else, and I can't remember, I've got to go back and, I mean, it's just attached to the mirror, I haven't looked at it for a long time. But I do think that those are what can bring enormous satisfaction. And it can be marriage, it can be kids, it can be being a scientist. For me, understanding the world that's around us is just such a joy. And I'm sometimes interested that people aren't as interested in that as I am, and then I find them interesting. But um, I would say that as I get older, I am interested in the intersection of humanities and science, of how does the meaning of place change from John Wayne to, you know, Brad Pitt to Robert Redford, to the future, because I think this intersection of place, I'm really hooked on sense of place. I think that when, so my, so my advice would be to be conscious that it isn't just whether we have the Wasatch Mountains and what makes them spectacular and tectonics and erosion and deposition. It's how that affects us and leads to who we are as individuals and as people. I mean, you are on a farm. It has made you in part who you are. To be conscious of the association of the natural world and meaning, um, that, that may not be real advice, but I think it is advice. I think we That's need that. Advice. Okay. Yes. Um. What would you like to be remembered for? I'd actually like to be remembered. The thing that I did that was really more important than anything else in the whole, all my career, was making the state safer, richer, and better against earthquakes, specifically water systems. So I was put on a water board, I'm about to go to a water conference, <coughs> that uh, where we could have just not paid attention to the redundancy of water systems in Salt Lake, County. But the staff knew, was interested in earthquakes, they just finished a master plan and they redid it because they knew they finally had someone on a board who was going to say earthquakes, seismic. And I didn't even realize what a difference I'd made until we put the point in the mountain water treatment plant, connect it to the west side, connect it to the east side, do that. And I don't think I'll be remembered for that, but it's what I think of myself. I mean, I think that Salt Lake County is, that's probably the biggest thing that I did individually. What I'll be remembered for, oh, I don't know. Maybe it's a phrase, know who you are, know where you are, know where you are, know who you are. I mean, how many students have I drummed that into? <laughs> I don't know what I'll be remembered for. Uh, hopefully a joy factor in science. Um, is there anything additional that you would like oh, to Oh no, I've talked to you so long and you've been such a good listener and <laughs> I enjoy talking to you. No, there's nothing. Is there anything additional? Uh, no, I don't think there is. You've been terrific. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was a joy. Okay, for I me particularly.